APUSH kids. This is the review that you would have gotten for the APUS history test if uh, we'd had another weekend of Saturday school. Um, so remember that I told you that uh, traditionally it was the STAR exam and then you had about a week for the APUS history exam. So we had like a week to go back over stuff. Uh, this year, since they're back to back Thursday, Friday, we do not have that opportunity. So uh, this basically is in the place of an entire Saturday, so I'm going to go very quickly. Um, this is the thematic review that's going to take you through several themes of U.S. history. So if there's one of them that you're like, I got this, then you can like just skip forward and um, get through it. But one of the dominant themes in um, U.S. history is really religion. So people came to the, what would become the United States, um, particularly the Puritans, under these ideas of religious um, freedom, or the idea at least that they needed religious freedom. So uh, in New England, you have the Puritans who are Calvinists coming because they're being ostracized in their own communities, therefore they come here so they can find their own pure place. We read uh, the City on the Hill document that they're trying to establish basically a new perfect place. Um, we also have, you know, this halfway covenant thing that they're having to make allowances within their religion over time because people are not able to um, adhere. So we have like the new lights, the old lights, like all of those things. Um, what's really important to the Puritans is education. They established Harvard in 1639. Remember that they didn't get here until 1620. So the fact that Harvard's being established so quickly is um, pretty incredible. But this shows the role that um, education plays in religion and vice versa. And so because uh, religion does require um, education and because education is such a cornerstone of it, um, in the colonies there is going to be very strong systems of education. In some places strong Stronger than they were in the old world. This is going to significantly contribute to um, standard of living, to um, even the revolution as people are going to be more, more literate and more able to like uh, speak back and forth to one, one another. Um, make sure you know John Winthrop. Um, make sure you remember the Salem Witch Trials. Um, it's not just the Puritans though that are coming over. There are other people that are coming for other things. Um, so the Quakers, are also ostracized in England. So they're coming to set up their own colony. So William Penn sets up his colony, which has toleration. So long as you adhere to the Quaker uh, beliefs, you can stay there. Um, like you just have to do their practices. You don't actually have to be a Quaker. Um, but there's sort of this like holy experiment starting in 1681, their Society of Friends. Remember that they treat the Native Americans well and it's, it's sort of a good place to be. Um, Catholics in uh, England are persecuted because, again, the Henry VIII thing. So we get the setup of the Maryland Act of Toleration, which makes it a haven for Catholics. Um, and so Anglicans, Catholics, Puritans, Quakers could all be found living in um, the English colonies in this time period. Um, in the middle of the 1700s, we have the First Great Awakening. Um, this is basically a resurgence of religious activity. This is led by Jonathan Edwards and other people. We read the uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's definitely something that uh, is getting people out of their chairs, getting people like excited about religion, and it's definitely um, making people take it more seriously and embrace religion more thoroughly. Um, it's really focusing on this like human sinfulness and how it leads to damnation unless basically you accept Jesus. Um, basically, it's, it's asking you to like look into your emotions and to think about that more than intellect. So it's really a changing of the Puritanism, but it's a it's a way definitely to get people more involved and to make people feel like that they need to make personal choices about their religion. Um, the Great Awakening is also really. Um, showing us that it is something that's being thought of religion in this time period and is very important to both. Um, deism is something that we went over briefly. Make sure that you remember it. Um, this is something that many of the founding fathers had thought in, that it wasn't perhaps um, so much of the biblical God. It was more that there was this God that is nature's God that established everything. Um, we looked at the Franklin um, idea of the clockmaker, right? That basically God set everything in motion and then let everything sort of roll from there. Um, and so the people that are establishing um, our founding documents, a lot of them aren't influenced by these DS beliefs. Therefore, um, this is going to influence how they react. Um, the second Great Awakening is going to happen in the 1800s, so after the revolution. 
this is another one of these uh, revival sort of meetings. Um, remember the burned over districts where basically there was a revival like once a month. Um, this sparks a lot of, of reform movements because again, it's like your personal duty. If you see sin happening to fix it, otherwise everyone is, it's doomed. Um, this is going to lead to uh, lots of reform in like public education by Horace Mann and prison reform by Dorothea Dix. Um, also the idea that maybe we should just like check out of society and make our own utopian societies. Um, this also leads to things like women's rights, temperance, abolition of slavery, all of these that are going on. Um, it's also leading to new sorts of religions being formed. Um, probably the, the biggest among these, the Mormons who end up settling in Utah. Um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, we get perhaps the third Great Awakening. Um, this is during the end of the Gilded Age, going into the Progressive Era. This idea, like, basically there are these robber barons, life is really terrible, um, but shouldn't we do something about this? So basically it's this Christian desire to improve the world through charity. So we talked about the social gospel, God has blessed you with either money or with intellect, and it's your job to fix the world through this. Um... Going into the 1920s, it's the question of fundamentalism versus modernism. So the Scopes trial is really representative of this. Um, so this idea that, okay, so we have all these modern ideas that you think science proves everything, but doesn't the biblical text also prove something? And so this idea of, like, are we going back to these foundational beliefs, or are we, like, embracing these new sorts of things that are happening? Um... We also have then in the 1970s to the present, this rise of the religious right, which some call the fourth great awakening. Uh, this would be like Phyllis Shapley, Pat Robinson, Jerry Falwell, the moral majority. Um, and this is again, trying to get back to this like idea of the United States being found as a Christian nations and going back to things in history. Um, so that's religion. Hopefully you could talk about how uh, religion in the United States changes over time. We, you could talk about like the cyclical nature of it, like how sometimes it's very dominant, sometimes not as much, um, etc. All right, so Native American history. Uh, they are here first. Uh, however, Columbus, Columbian Exchange, many die. Not so great for them. Uh, we also have like interactions between settlers and Native Americans that are not so pleasant um, in the uh, British colonies as well. Uh, King Philip's War uh, is probably the the most well known of these. Really devastates New England, but is this first really big uh, confrontation between them. Uh, do you remember the Iroquois Confederacy, which basically influenced this idea of like a union, a group of people that could be banded together? Um, we can debate whether or not this does play a role, but do know that these ideas that are being like America, Confederation, unity, were also being seen in Native American tribes. Um, definitely Pontiac's Rebellion in 1763, which is against settlers who were trying to move uh, west of the Appalachian Mountains, plays a huge role. Um, in order to appease uh, the Native Americans who uh, basically have just fought a massive war against the colonists, they say, all right, colonists, you can't move west of this line. The colonists obviously do not like being told they can't do this, particularly to a group that, in theory, should have been just defeated in this uh, French and Indian War. Um, when Washington takes the presidency, he starts this sort of civilization process. So this idea that basically Native Americans are equal to Americans, but their society is inferior. Um, we then, you know, sort of get more into a, uh, like, battle sort of situation. Uh, we covered the Battle of Fallen Timbers, uh, Tecumseh, the Prophet, Battle of Tippecanoe, Tippecanoe, Tyler II later on, and the Seminole War in Florida. But basically this idea that if Native Americans will not um, subjugate themselves, if Native Americans will not move, they will be dominated um, by whites. Uh, definitely the, the head of this is the Indian Removal Act, um, Think of this as like Jefferson and Washington versus Jackson. So this idea that they got to get out, like they should not be incorporated into our society. Uh, Worcester versus Georgia is the court case that says, no, Andrew Jackson, you can't make the move. But then Andrew Jackson says, you know, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it, which leads to the Trail of Tears and really this this Western push of Native Americans. Um, after the Civil War, we have many um, Native American battles again. Uh, they have been given um, a little bit of freedom during the Civil War, but now it's going to definitely be more whites wanting to expand, therefore trying to get the Plains Indians onto reservations. Um, and really it's the decimation of the buffalo and the decline of their, their way of life that's going to lead to the decline of the Plains Indians in addition to these wars. Um, so the last big win for Native Americans is going to be uh, 
basically them defeating Custer. However, um, this is not going to be like a, a upswing. Um, Helen Hunt Jackson writes the text Century of Dishonor, basically saying that all these treaties, all these various things have been broken. And, and really the 1880s on are going to be uh, either killing or paying on reservations. So the Dawes Severity Act is that kill the Indian, save the man, uh, basically break up reservations, sell their land, make them into Americans. We looked at the um, Indian schools and the various things like this. Uh, we looked at the uh, battle or the massacre of Wounded Knee in South Dakota, prospered by or brought about by the Ghost Dance. Um, it's really the last battle of it. Um, in 1824, they're given uh, U.S. citizenship, and really, as someone in the class said earlier, we kind of forget about Native Americans for like a 50-year period. Hence, the bringing up of the. American Indian Movement, the occupation of Wounded Knee, of the Bureau of Indian Affairs headquarters, etc. Um, and so the name of the game was basically like try and incorporate into the society. If that does not work, uh, kill or push off. Um, and this was the dominant theme. Um, by the 1930s, Native Americans are living on reservations. These are not great places. Native Americans feel that they have been um, sort of left out of all this movement and therefore the American Indian Movement, which we can argue is still going on. Um, as they try and bring awareness to their case to causes. All right, so women's history. Uh, in the colonial um, society, women are usually not the equal of men. In the Chesapeake colonies, remember, though, women are going to have more rights just because they're a scarcer commodity. Um, Anne Hutchinson, do you remember, thrown out of the Puritan colonies for being too radical. Uh, do you remember your idea of Republican motherhood that basically uh, is the job of women to teach their sons, their daughters, how to be good Americans, therefore they're integral in this process? Uh, and remember ladies like Abigail Adams who are reminding their husbands to remember the ladies when crafting these documents. In the early 1800s, we have the cult of domesticity, that women have their two separate spheres, and that there's a sphere for women, a sphere for men, and they never the two should meet. However, as we start the uh, Industrial Revolution, as we start the factory systems, uh, women begin to move away from the homes and live in these factories, the Lowell system. We looked at the Lowell girls. And even though conditions are not too terribly great there, it is like away from family. You have more opportunity. You have more things. Uh, the Seneca Falls Convention in 1843 is going to be basically saying that all men and women are created equal. Elizabeth K. Stan, Lucretia Mott, um, basically arguing that uh, women should be given the same rights as men. Um, um, the Grimke sisters and others become very, very active for both women's rights and for um, the abolition of slavery. And um, after the Civil War, we see again another push for women's rights. And this is where we get that second generation with Susan B. Anthony, Victoria Woodhull, uh, Jane Addams, and really this fight for suffrage and this like fight for progressive reform. Um, so there was a fight to include suffrage in the 15th Amendment, however... Um, it was not given, but states on their own were able to give women the right to vote. Um, the 19th Amendment in 1920 gives women the right to vote, and uh, this is going to be a, a big turning point in this. Um, in the early 1900s, we have uh, a changing role of um, Americans. So Margaret Singer is arguing for birth control, which would give women more freedom. Uh, we talked about in the 20s, we have the flappers, who are women who are you know, having more authority. Um, Rosie the Riveter in World War II, uh, leaving the home, working in jobs that men would only be doing. Eleanor Roosevelt acting as proxy to her husband, acting in the same capacities. Um, in 18, or 1963, Betty Friedan writes The Femme Mystique, which remember we said, she asked that question, is this it? So is it that women should be in this, this locked-in cult of domesticity that we saw in the 1950s, that all they can do is make sandwiches for their kids and not be able to live their own life? So um, when we get the Civil Rights Act of 1964, gender is left out. And so people like Betty Friedan say, hey, shouldn't we also have gender in here because they are also or segregated against? Um, so we get the National Organization for Women now in 1966 in the Women's Liberation Movement. In 1981, Sandra Day O'Connor is appointed to be the first um, female Supreme Court justice. And we do get uh, advocation for the Equal Rights Amendment, although it's not passed um, by enough state governments because of the work of Phyllis Shafley and other conservatives who actually argue that calling women the equal of men would hurt the family, would actually hurt the role of women. 
We've also had many uh, female vice presidential candidates and in Hillary Clinton, female presidential candidates. All right, African American history. So first Amer Africans were brought to Virginia in 1619. Um, they were first treated as indigenous servants, but then it became this uh, definite race-based sort of slavery. Um, the first colony to uh, legalize is Massachusetts, 1650 or 1641, and then it's going to be legal in all the colonies by the early 1700s. However, um, it's it's really going to stay in those colonies that really have a need for um, agriculture. Uh, Stoner Rebellion is the earliest uh, slave rebellion in America, and this is going to lead to a lot of um, slave codes and various things like this. They try to flee to Spanish Florida, which becomes a running theme in U.S. history of going to Florida to escape. Uh, Nat Turner's Rebellion and Stoner Rebellion are probably the two most significant rebellions that happen. Uh, the Declaration of Independence does not call for an abolition of slavery, but remember that it did say by the by, I remember that King George, he's the one that, you know, brought these sorts of things. Um, the Northwest Ordinance in 1787 is the first document to actually prohibit slavery from being expanded. And the Constitutional Convention, of course, has our three-fifths compromise and the slave trade compromise as well. Um, however, like, as as things are progressing, we're starting to see um, more rebellions, particularly in the Katy and places like this, that are causing slave revolts in the South, um, leading to more slave codes, things like this, Prosser's Rebellion, other ones make this there. But really, it's the cotton gin that makes slavery po uh, profitable um, because it makes the cultivation of cotton so profitable. Um, the slave trade is outlawed in 1808. However, natural increase leads this to really not need this to happen. Um, the majority of white Southerners own no slaves. However, there is this sort of vein in U.S. history that you want to always allow for those above you to have rights because you aspire to one day be them. But it's really King Cotton that's keeping all of this in place. Um, so we see a lot of compromises through the 1800s about the expansion of slavery. The first is 1820, the Missouri Compromise, and then the rest are going to sort of uh, divide these lines and bring these things around. Um, again, many rebellions. Uh, lots of abolitionists working against uh, the practice of slavery. William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass are probably are uh, the ones we talk the most about. Um, but it's really the, the actions of that Second Great Awakening that really put a lot of people in this camp of not being for slavery. And so we get the American Anti-Slavery Society, the Free Soil Party, the Republican Party will be formed that will have some anti-slavery sort of events to it. In 1854, Congress passes the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which repeals the Missouri Compromise and says that instead of it being just like by a line, it can be decided by popular sovereignty, which this leads to, um, you know, bloodshed. It leads to then, you know, the, the caning of uh, Charles Sumner. And really, this is not going to be looking like this is going to be something that can continue to happen. In Dred Scott versus Sanford, 1857, we get the declaration that the slaves are not citizens, therefore cannot sue, um, which is going to lead to the need of a 14th Amendment. Emancipation Proclamation, 1863, punishes the South by freeing their slaves. Um, after the Civil War, we get the three Reconstruction Amendments. We memorize as free citizens vote. Um, However, after the Compromise of 1877, we basically just see a return to the way things were. Um, so it no longer being held under slavery, they're now being held under sharecropping. And instead of them being slave codes, they're now black codes. So things are obviously going back um, to the way that it was before. And because the North is checked out, they've got their own problems they're dealing with, um, they're unable to address this. Um, so voting rights and various things are taken away from African Americans after Reconstruction, and uh, Jim Crow laws are adapted by the states. The case Blessy versus Ferguson makes these Jim Crow laws like the law of the land, therefore they are going to be it. There are, however, African Americans who are working for um, more compromise, more working together. We read Booker T. Washington's Atlanta Compromise speech, which basically says, hey, white people, look around, use the black people around you to help you in your efforts. Do not just cast them aside. In opposition to this, uh, we read W. Du Bois, um, particularly his document on Booker T. Washington and others, who said that instead of uh, looking at... Um, you know, what you can do for white people, black people should be, you know, looking at what they can do for themselves. And so he says by educating this talented tenth of your, your population, in any population, white or black, you're going to lead to the advancement of your people. 
And so people like Ida B. Wells, other progressives, are working towards um, more equality, more education. Um, the film Birth of a Nation, 1915, we talked about as being a great document as to what the ideal of the Civil War was a generation after, and really why many African Americans would want to move north um, after World War One and World War Two, which leads to the first or this great migration, and to the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, Truman integrates the military in 1947, um, but the the Harlem Renaissance is really leading to a lot of different things. Um, it's leading to this new culture, this new idea, um, what we would call the New Negro. Uh, Marcus Garvey is back to Africa movement, um, but in the New Deal, we're also seeing um, a shift in voting patterns. So. Rather than voting for Republicans, uh, African Americans are not going to be voting for Democrats um, in some numbers because they are supporting um, FDR, because they are supporting the actions that are happening there. Um, remember, too, we talked about the incident with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and the DAR when um, she arranges for an African American singer to sing um, who had been told by this organization that she could not. We then get into the Civil Rights Movement, which we covered so much in class, I feel like you have. Um, if you don't, there's that whole like tax review on the civil rights movement, which I think would be great to go over. Um, but do remember, you go from um, this more like passive resistance um, to a little bit more violent, re uh, violent reaction with things like Malcolm X, um, things like this. Um, and then finally with Stokely Carmichael, um, who are going to be leading to this black power movement. Um, so do make sure that you know these people, make sure you know um, the various things that are going on. Um, okay, immigration. So before 1880, immigrants are mostly coming from Europe, so the first great migration of English Puritans, then we have Scots, Irish, and Germans in the 1700s, and Irish in the 1840s because of the potato famine. Um, immigrants become coming from Southern Eastern Europe after 1880. So if you're saying immigration before World War, I'm sorry, before the Civil War, you're talking from mostly, uh, you know, Northern Europe. And if you're talking like after that, you're talking Southern Eastern Europe. This is going to be the new wave. They're mostly going to be in cities. They're mostly going to be unskilled laborers. And this is going to be the wave that, um, is going to be working in the factories in the Gilded Age. We have the Chinese Exclusion Act, which bans all Chinese from entering, and many different groups that are working to keep people from um, coming in and out. Uh, within the United States, we have African American migration that we've just talked about. We have laws being passed keeping people out, like uh, laws requiring literacy tests. Also, the National Origins Act, 1920, and the various laws during the 20s that are part of the Red Scare xenophobia um, that lead to less people being allowed in. Um, the Bracero program, we talked about um, Mexican-Americans or Mexicans being invited in, becoming uh, American citizens to work. Um, the McCrane-Walter Act combines all immigration law into one document. And then we talk about this move from the Rust Belt or the Frost Belt to the Sun Belt. Um, the Immigration Act of 1964 restructures the quota system, this is Johnson, and the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which is amnesty signed by uh, Reagan in 1986. Um, and we've talked about how immigration is still a very controversial subject, will always be a controversial subject. Um, from the know nothings to today, there are people that dislike it. From then till today, there are people that like it. Okay, you should be able to write a paper on this, I would hope. If you cannot, come in and talk to me. All right, labor unions, labor laws, labor strikes, work. So the Knights of Labor, the Industrial Workers of the World, and the American Federation of Labor are all examples of unions. Remember, unions are there during the Gilded Age, really get a lot of strength during the Progressive Era, trying to make um, things fair for workers. Um, there were a lot of strikes that we talked about, but they didn't get too terribly much done because a lot of the time it's unskilled laborers. Also, you do not have the, uh, the help of the federal government on these things. Um, additionally, things like the Wagner Act are going to make it very hard for you to strike, particularly during like national crisis. Um, however, we do see in the progressive era some like reforms being made. So we see uh, limiting work hours for women in Muller versus Oregon. We see the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire really bringing a lot of um, people against this. Um, and so we start to see things like this. Um, 
I would mostly just know that as the 20th century progresses, if there is a red scare, if we are afraid of communists, we become afraid of unions and sort of vice versa. But unions have been able to make great strides because they can get the backing of the people behind them. Um, and, you know, whether we're talking about like factory workers in the 1900s or we're talking about farm workers, Cesar Chavez, um, we are seeing a bit of this happen. Okay, you should be able to write this question. If you can't, come talk to me. Okay, books and writings you should know. Common Sense. Federalist Papers. Know them. Uh, Book of Mormon or just the Mormonism exists would be good. Democracy in America. Know it. Know it. Know it. If you read excerpts from it, you will read excerpts from it next year. Remember, he is a French guy who brings legitimacy to this because um, he is an outsider saying that he sees this thing. Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass gets people to the... Um, cause resistance to civil government through, th I'm sorry, Thoreau is going to be incredibly important because it's going to give this idea of if there's an unjust law, it is your job to break it. Uncle Tom's Cabin, Little Lady Who Wrote the Big Book, Star of the War, Progress and Poverty, again, part of this uh, sort of Gilded Age trying to progressive era. Um, Century of Dishonor, looking at um, the problems going on with Native Americans. Uh, Edward Bellamy, addressing the problems of the Gilded Age. Uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan, influence the sea power upon history. Very influential to Teddy Roosevelt and others who are wanting to increase the size of our military. Uh, the Significance of the Frontier in American History, Frederick Jackson Turner, Turner thesis that we read. This idea that the frontier is super important to us and this idea that we must always push. Charles Shelton and his steps. This is the uh, social gospel. Uh, Shame of the Cities, Progressive Era, The Jungle, The Meat is Gross, Do Not Eat It, leads to the Pure Food and Drug Act. Um, Silent Spring, 1962, leads to the passing of the um, EPA, other things like this. Um, Betty Friedan, The Feminine Mystique, Letter from a Burning Hand Jail. Okay, you should be able to talk about each of those books and what they did. If you can't, come see me. Art music, know the Hudson River School, looking at the majesty of the United States, painting it, showing it to other people. Ashcan School, looking at the dirty, the gross stuff that's going around, showing it to people. It's almost like muckraking, but muckraking for art. Uh, art music, know the Harlem Renaissance, no jazz, no rock and roll. Okay, could you answer this? I hope that you can. I'm hoping that you would go with literature and probably music. If you could go with art, go with art, but I feel like you can go with literature and music. Okay, terms. Know your mercantilism. Know your lays affair. Know your tariff. Know your recession, your recovery, your inflation, your deflation. Specie, just talking about like the actual like currency, supply demand. Uh, know the London Company, Fallon's Jamestown, um, triangular trade, navigation acts, salutary neglect, these things these things. Okay, make sure that you could talk about the bank and why it was so controversial and why it was a good thing. Also be able to talk about the excise tax, how that excise tax, how it leads to the Whiskey Rebellion, other things like this. Why Hamilton's plan and the Henry Clay system are going to be so um, controversial to people like Jackson. Um, so make sure that you can speak about these things. Make sure that you could talk about the panics and various things that result because of the lack of a bank. Um, make sure you can talk about how, like, as we get closer to our era, we start to really see that the, the American system is what we need, and we start to develop more steamboats, railroads, things like this. Um, second Industrial Revolution, the problems of these things with the robber barons and the trusts and monopolies, the growth of the labor unions, um, their strikes and what they do, the Grange, the Populist Party, Monetary policy. Make sure that you could talk about like how this changes over time, particularly the gold-silver debate um, as we're getting to um, the elections, um, the impact of like gold rushes and things like this. Um, make sure you could talk about how like as we get in the progressive era, we start to regulate our economy more. So like Roosevelt and other people are going to be working to get rid of the ta the tariffs, get rid of. I'm sorry, get rid of the. Uh, the trusts and things like this. Also, uh, Wilson is going to be working on the banks with the Federal Reserve System. Uh, make sure that you can talk about uh, the Progressive Era, the 16th Amendment. Make sure you know those Progressive Amendments, income, senators, wine, women. Uh, and then make sure that you could talk about like 
the 1920s, the return to normalcy, the back to the laissez-faire, which then leads to the Great Depression. Make sure you can talk about the causes of the Great Depression, why Hoover's plan didn't work, and about the New Deal and what it did. Um, make sure that you can talk about Keynesian economics and why um, that is a thing and this like priming the pump. Um, we've talked about a lot in class like Keynesian versus like the trickle down and supply slide. Make sure you could discuss this. Um, make sure that you understand the war on poverty, the great society programs, and why it was that Johnson was not able to push these through because of um, the Vietnam War. Um, make sure you, you remember the stagflation and the supply side economics of Reagan. Okay, make sure you know these elections. Okay, the 1800 is the revolution of 1800, which is the first big transition of power. The Jackson, John Quincy Adams, we have the corrupt bargain. Uh, the Lincoln, Douglas, Breckinridge Bell is just the, the crisis of 1860 leading to the Civil War. Hayes Tilden is the one that's leading us to Reconstruction, or the end of Reconstruction. McKinley Bryan is the gold-silver debate that gets McKinley there and then um, Roosevelt. The 1912 Wilson-Roosevelt-Taft-Dubs is the next four-way one. Again, anytime we have all these people in, it shows that we're in a time of great turmoil in the United States. Franklin Roosevelt versus Hoover in 1932 dramatically changes the course of our country. Kennedy Nixon, the first real television um, debate of it. The Nixon Humphrey Wallace showing just one how like persistent this idea of segregation still is, but also this like hold that LBJ leaves when he withdraws from the can't see. Uh, the Reagan Carter Anderson again more turmoil in 1980. Then Bush Gore in 2000, the very contentious election. Okay. Make sure that you know these phrases, war for the empire, join or die, corrupt bargain, manifest destiny, particular institution, meaning, meaning slavery, bleeding Kansas, king cotton, Seward's folly, aka the buying of Alaska, robber barons, uh, you know, the guys who are the titans of industry, the new immigration, which would be those coming from um, southern Europe, um, twisting the lion's tail, like provoking, Remember the Maine, getting into the Spanish-American War, the Square Deal, which is uh, Teddy Roosevelt's program, the New Freedom, which is Wilson's program, the New Deal, which is Franklin Roosevelt's program, uh, Massive Retaliation, or MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, which is the idea that the Soviets bomb us, we bomb them times a thousand, Great Society, LBJ. Okay, make sure you know your Great Compromises, <laughs> and I told you there were so many of them. Uh, the Great Compromise of eighteen or of 1787 is the one about um, who's going to have power, small states, big states. Three-fifths Compromise is how much is a slave going to count for. Missouri Compromise um, is setting the boundary line. Compromise of 1833 is the tariff. Compromise of 1850 is, again, another slavery compromise. Uh, same is true of the Catan. Uh, compromise of 1877 is the one that is... Uh, Ending Reconstruction in the South. Atlanta Compromise is what Booker T. Washington is proposing. Um, make sure that you know our expansion of territory, why it happens, when it happens. Make sure that if you saw it on the map, you could put it there. Make sure you know your treaties. Treaty of Paris, uh, there's a lot of them, so they're always a good guess. This is the one that ends the uh, French and Indian War. This is the Treaty of Paris that ends the American Revolution. Jay's Treaty, does the compromise of those places. Treaty of Ghent is the War of 1812. Adam's own niece is Florida. Guadalupe Hidalgo is the Mexican-American War. Treaty of Paris of 1898 is the Spanish-American War. Treaty of Versailles is World War I. Um, make sure you know your NATO, your Warsaw Pact, uh, all these various groups. Okay, could you answer this question? Or this one? Or this one. Or that one. Or this one. Okay. If you find that you can't answer these questions, then you are in an excellent place. If you find that you cannot and that you are very confused by everything that's happening, you are not in an excellent place. And you should come into tutoring and we should talk about it. So until then, I will see you later.